Hey there, it's Lee from CORE. And I'm excited to share with you some thoughts right now about New Year's resolutions. You know, for all of us, those resolutions can be so challenging and so disappointing. I think we've all had the experience of making resolutions and having them fall apart. Why does it happen? Uh, what can we do about it? And I want to share with you some best practices and some experience we have from the core perspective on how we can win this year as we start this year with your New Year's resolution. So obviously the problem that we all know is we, we make them and we break them, right? That's kind of the universal condition of you, you, New Year's resolutions. We, we make them, we break them, they fall apart. And then what happens often with that is then we swing back even further the other way. So you may have an experience of that particular pain and disappointment that comes with breaking a resolution. It's almost worse than if we had made the, the decision or the promise or the new vision to begin with. You know, we've started something, we've committed to it, we've doubled down. It's really painful when we break it. And in a certain way, that's one of the real challenges of New Year's resolutions. It's a broken promise, usually to ourself, and it swings us back and it pings us in a particular way. Now, why does this happen? For those of you who've been part of the core world, you know we have a way of thinking about the human experience that I think is really helpful here. We think of our experience in, in the three selves, the healthy self, the wounded self, and the survivor self. It's this interplay between the healthy self and the survivor self that is really key to this exploration. Broken resolutions hurt. Broken resolutions, unwinnable resolutions, are usually made from the survivor self. So the question you wanna ask yourself is, what part of me is making this resolution? If it's the survivor self, watch out. And that is often the part of us that's making a resolution. Survivor self is almost always reacting to something. So if it's a resolution that's in reaction, that's one of the hallmarks of the survivor self. So let's talk a little bit more about that. How do you know if you're making a resolution from the survivor self, because that's what you really want to be curious about. So a few things to note about that. When we are making uh, some of the hallmarks, you might say, when we're making a resolution from the survivor self, firstly, it often has a gripping quality. It has a I gotta quality, I have to quality, like an urgent quality. In and of itself, not a bad thing. Right. We'll talk about that in just a second. But often with the survivor self, it's got this kind of I gotta. It's got what we might call a desperate quality. Have you felt that? I have. I've made resolutions and decisions that come from that desperate place. So that's the first thing you want to notice. And this is an embodied feeling. When we feel that kind of gripping, like I gotta, that's an embodied feeling. Second thing, often survivor self resolutions have a negative objective. So it's I don't want to do this. I am going to stop drinking or stop doing this, stop doing that. It, it has a, a sense of moving away from something instead of moving towards something. And that's where the resolution ends. And the third hallmark would be that it has a should behind it. So survivor self resolutions are often powered by the should. I should do this. I should do it. Sometimes for some unknown reason or for someone else, I should do it. Okay. Now, so the gripping the I gotta and the negative objective and the should are not terrible things. Here's the thing. They are the beginning of an inquiry. They in and of themselves do not justify a resolution. So they're the beginning of an inquiry. But when we, when we take those kind of reactive postures and we build a resolution on it, we've turned that inquiry into a resolution. That's the survivor self functioning. That's the survivor self. So you wanna, you wanna note that. Because as I said, the question here is not so much what the resolution is, right? Not so much what it is, even down to the exact description of what it is. The question is what part of you is driving the bus? The survivor self or the healthy self? Couple more quick hallmarks to kind of distinguish the survivor self, if that survivor self is making a resolution. Another one is it's fantastic. And I mean that in, not in the great sense of fantastic, it's fantastical, we might say the day-to-day -day sense of how it might live in reality either is unrealistic or isn't clear. So it's like, well, I'm, I am not going to be mad again. I'm never going to be angry again. Or I'm going to be loving to my spouse from now on. Well, that's beautiful. 
but it's not connected to the reality of, of what life may actually bring. And more importantly, it's not connected to the how is that actually going to live in the day to day. So if it has that fantastic quality, watch out for that. Right. And the last thing I would say to recognize a survivor self leading the way when we make a resolution is that it's perfection oriented instead of excellence oriented. Again, I'm speaking from my own experience here as a perfectionist. It has a sense of seeking perfection. So I would define perfection this way for our discussion. It's the illusion of a one time event that will solve all problems. That's what I mean by perfection. It's the illusion of a one time event that will solve the problems. That's perfection. Okay, it's it is pure. It is clear. It is only this. And when our resolutions are geared towards perfection instead of excellence, we are destined for failure. Right. We're destined for failure. I'm speaking from my own experience. Now, what's at stake if the survivor self runs the show in making resolutions? Well, a lot is at stake. Um, every time we make a resolution from the survivor self and it fails, which it will, it's another way that we fortify the survivor self. Let me say it again because I think that's really important. Every time we make a resolution that's driven by the survivor self, which is destined to fail, because the survivor self part of me doesn't know how to make a good healthy resolution. When it fails, it just becomes more fodder for the survivor self, more blame, more, oh, I told you so. Oh, you can't do it. See, more shame, more pain. Okay, that's, that's one of the real problems. That's why it's important to get under this. Another thing is that we actually just move further away from achieving what it is we wanted to achieve. Whatever that spirit of that resolution was to be more giving, to be more loving, to be more healthy, we move further away from it. That's not great. And then the second thing that happens, the reason this is important is that old habit persists. Whatever that habit was, it persists. And when we have a resolution, as I said at the beginning, that we break, it has a way of kind of doubling down on us. It's like we feed it. We feed it. So that that particular habit or that particular pain point or that particular unskillful quality grows, right? So what doesn't work? In a moment, we're going to talk about what does work. What are, what are good best practices? Let's talk about what doesn't work for just a minute in making a resolution, being perfection oriented, what I just mentioned before. So perfection, not going to work when we have the idea of this is, this is again, the illusion of a one-time event that's going to make everything work. That's perfection, not going to work. Going solo usually doesn't work. So the sense of I got this secret resolution that I'm not going to get any support with from anybody else. That's a little bit of a sign. We've got to watch out for that. We've got to look out. That's probably not going to work, right? Any resolution that involves first and foremost thinking is probably not going to work, right? Thinking based resolutions, problem solving resolutions that involve sitting and thinking, I'm going to think about this probably doesn't work. What that means is I'm going to worry about it and ruminate about it and it's going to disappear and I'm going to fail at it. And uh, that's not the same thing as problem solving or journaling or writing about or brainstorming, right? Um, and then the other thing that's not going to work is any universal, any huge universal decision. So a decision that doesn't leave any room for error. I'm simply done with this thing. A little bit of like the perfection thing, right? So that's just an opportunity for my ego to be inflated or deflated and I'm either going to win or lose. And um, it's also a recipe for failure. So what's the solution? How can we make resolutions that work? We'd say, well, we want resolutions that come from the healthy self. Number one, right? Ask yourself, what part of me is making this resolution? And as I said, this can be a, the same exact step. So for me, the one resolution I have this year, I have a couple that I'll share with you. One is I'm going to give up sugar. Now I've gone through this periodically in my life and there are periods when I stop eating sugar and carbs and kind of do paleo diets or keto diets and that thing. And that decision to give up sugar can come from two different places. It can come from the survivor self or the healthy self. So I want to know, I want to cultivate that that decision is coming from driven from the healthy self. How can I do that? Well, first of all, it's about excellence, right? What is excellence? Excellence involves me cultivating this wonderful word. Take that word with you. Cultivating something over a long period of time. Long, weeks, months, the year, right? Cultivating. Cultivating leaves room for failure. And in fact, excellence involves 
failure. Because instead of perfection, which is that illusion of a one-time event, excellence is something I build, I succeed at, I fail at, I build a little more, and maybe I fail again, maybe I drop the ball a little, I pick it back up again, and over time I learn and I grow. It's very different than perfection. And here's kind of the golden secret to, to excellence. It's all about our approach to failure. How we approach failure is the, the secret ingredient, right? Failure is approached very differently from the survivor self and the healthy self. When I fail, the survivor self part of me uses that as further evidence of why I'm not good or beloved or smart enough or likable or all the other stories that the survivor self has, right? That's what happens when I fail and the survivor self analyzes it, right? When I bring it, I want to give you this phrase to take with you this year. When I bring compassionate curiosity to my misstep, I'm bringing the healthy self online. That's one of the hallmarks of the healthy self is compassionate curiosity. I'll give you another example of what I'm doing right now. I'm doing a digital decluttering, which is stepping away periodically throughout the day from everything digital, including this wonderful medium that I'm using right now. I, I am not on it most of the day and cell phone and email and all these things. I'm periodically stepping away. Yesterday, I dropped the ball on this a little bit. And I had set times and I, I veered out of my set time of my digital decluttering. And man, did I notice it? Did I feel it? It felt pretty crappy. At the end of the day, I reflected on it. I was like, man, this doesn't, this didn't feel good. What happened today? So there's two different ways I could go with that, right? I can go with the hammer, the survivor self, the perfectionist, which would have me lose that resolution. Or I can bring compassionate curiosity and say, okay, what's what's going on? What's going on? And I start again, which I did. That's a healthy self-resolution, right? Um, one other thing we can do to, to cultivate the healthy self is to get under the should. That's what I call it. I call it getting under the should. When we've got a should, I should do this. I think I should do this. Some part of me feels like I should do this. I want to bring compassionate curiosity to ask why. Why should I do this? Not, not to say that I shouldn't necessarily do it. But when there's a should, we need to go further under into the should, right? When we have, I feel I should do something for myself, for my spouse, for my friend, for my family. If it stays at that should, we have an interesting way of rebelling against shoulds. But when we get under it and explore it more deeply, and that's a healthy self quality. Then we get close to our values and what's important to us and why we're doing something. So that's a great exploration to cultivate, to ask yourself, to get under the should, and ask yourself why. Um, and one other thing to do is to, to see what this looks like in real life. Any resolution needs to live in real life. So outside of that fantastical way of thinking that it's just magically going to happen, right? Like I make that plan, both for my sugar detox and for my digital decluttering. I've got a plan, and I know what it looks like in real life. And it'll, it'll wobble a little bit, but I'm pretty on it, and I'm very aware of it. So it's not magical thinking, right? And that takes patience and discernment, and that's also a quality of the healthy self. So these are some of the things that will help you cultivate your healthy self. I also want to give you one other tip that I think is really valuable as you, as you make resolutions from your healthy self. And that is find those things that remind you of your healthy self, of your goodness. This is actually really important. I could, I could do a whole talk on this and I won't right now, but you wanna find those things that remind you of your goodness, of your value, of your belovedness, right? Now this may sound a little woo woo or a little new agey and it's not. And the reason this is really important is because an action that comes from me trying to prove that I'm worthy or valuable or loved is different than an action that comes from me knowing, oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm worthy of love. I'm, I'm good. I, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm good. And that action, that, that, that same thing that I do comes from two different places and it'll have two different, two different ways of living in the world, right? So you want to find things that remind you of your goodness. So, my invitation for you this year is to set your resolutions from your healthy self. Get to know your healthy self, right? Um, know what it feels like, how it functions in you, so that you can choose things that foster 
the healthy self. So who are the people, places, and things that foster the healthy self in you and that remind you of your innate value as a person? And the last invitation I want to give you this year as you head into this wonderful year ahead of us, this challenging, exciting year, is to join us for a men's or women's immersion weekend. These are the weekends we set aside at CORE to cultivate this very place, this healthy, healthy self place. And in that space, you will be reminded of your goodness and your belovedness and how valuable you are. And you'll have a chance to courageously look at the survivor self part of you that may be sabotaging or tanking or uh, pulling you off course. And we all have one. And so you get a loving space to look at something really challenging. And it's a compassionate, loving place where you can cultivate your healthy self, get under those shoulds, right? And with courage and compassion and step into the best version of yourself. So that's the men's and women's immersion weekends. We have them all throughout the year at CORE. And I invite you this year to let this be the year that you step into that best version of yourself and choose one of these weekends that will um, support you in doing that. Wishing you all the best as you head into a prosperous and exciting and beautiful new year.